Section 32 of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Why Do We Need a Public Library? by Various. Section 32. Rights of Man, Part the First, Being an Answer to Mr. Burke's Attack on the French Revolution, by Thomas Paine. Part 4. Miscellaneous Chapter To prevent interrupting the argument in the preceding part of this work, or the narrative that follows it, I reserved some observations to be thrown together in a miscellaneous chapter, by which variety might not be censured for confusion. Mr. Burke's book is all miscellany. His intention was to make an attack on the French Revolution, but instead of proceeding with an orderly arrangement, he has stormed it with a mob of ideas tumbling over and destroying one another. But this confusion and contradiction in Mr. Burke's book is easily accounted for. When a man in a wrong cause attempts to steer his course by anything else than some polar truth or principle, he is sure to be lost. It is beyond the compass of his capacity to keep all the parts of an argument together and make them unite in one issue by any other means than having this guide always in view. Neither memory nor invention will supply the want of it. The former fails him and the latter betrays him. Notwithstanding the nonsense, for it deserves no better name, that Mr. Burke has asserted about hereditary rights and hereditary succession, and that a nation has not a right to form a government of itself, it happened to fall in his way to give some account of what government is. Quote, government, says he, is a contrivance of human wisdom. Unquote. Admitting that government is a contrivance of human wisdom, it must necessarily follow that hereditary succession and hereditary rights, as they are called, can make no part of it, because it is impossible to make wisdom hereditary. And on the other hand, that cannot be a wise contrivance, which in its operation may commit the government of a nation to the wisdom of an idiot. The ground which Mr. Burke now takes is fatal to every part of his cause. The argument changes from hereditary rights to hereditary wisdom, and the question is, who is the wisest man? He must now show that everyone in the line of hereditary succession was a Solomon, or his title is not good to be a king. What a stroke has Mr. Burke now made? To use a sailor's phrase, he has swabbed the deck and scarcely left a name legible in the list of kings, and he has mowed down and thinned the House of Peers with a scythe as formidable as death and time. But Mr. Burke appears to have been aware of this retort, and he has taken care to guard against it by making government to be not only a contrivance of human wisdom, but a monopoly of wisdom. He puts the nation as fools on one side, and places his government of wisdom, all wise men of Gotham, on the other side. And he then proclaims and says that, quote, men have a right that their wants should be provided for by this wisdom, unquote. Having thus made proclamation, he next proceeds to explain to them what their wants are, and also what their rights are. In this he has succeeded dexterously, for he makes their wants to be a want of wisdom, but as this is cold comfort, he then informs them that they have a right not to any of the wisdom, but to be governed by it, and in order to impress them with a solemn reverence for this monopoly government of wisdom, and of its vast capacity for all purposes, possible or impossible, right or wrong, he proceeds with astrological mysterious importance to tell them its powers in these words, quote, The rights of man in government are their advantages, and these are often in balance between differences of good, and in compromises sometimes between good and evil, and sometimes between evil and evil. Political reason is a computing principle, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, morally and not metaphysically or mathematically, true moral denominations, unquote. As the wondering audience, whom Mr. Burke supposes himself talking to, may not understand all this learned jargon, I will undertake to be its interpreter. The meaning, then, good people, of all this is, that government is governed by no principle whatever, that it can make evil good or good evil just as it pleases, in short, that government is arbitrary power. But there are some things which Mr. Burke has forgotten. First, he has not shown where the wisdom originally came from, and secondly, he has not shown by what authority it first began to act. In the manner he introduces the matter, it is either government stealing wisdom or wisdom stealing government. 
it is without an origin, and its powers without authority. In short, it is usurpation. Whether it be from a sense of shame or from a consciousness of some radical defect in a government necessary to be kept out of sight, or from both, or from any other cause, I undertake not to determine. But so it is, that a monarchical reasoner never traces government to its source or from its source. It is one of the shibboleths by which he may be known. A thousand years hence, those who shall live in America or France will look back with contemplative pride on the origin of their government and say, this was the work of our glorious ancestors. But what can a monarchical talker say? What has he to exult in? Alas, he is nothing. A certain something forbids him to look back to a beginning, lest some robber or some Robin Hood should rise from the long obscurity of time and say, I am the origin. Hard as Mr. Burke labored at the Regency Bill and hereditary succession two years ago, and much as he dived for precedence, he still had not boldness enough to bring up William of Normandy and say, There is the head of the list, there is the fountain of honor, the son of a prostitute, and the plunderer of the English nation. The opinions of men with respect to government are changing fast in all countries. The revolutions of America and France have thrown a beam of light over the world which reaches into man. The enormous expense of governments has provoked people to think by making them feel and when once the veil begins to rend, it admits not of repair. Ignorance is of a peculiar nature. Once dispelled, it is impossible to re-establish it. It is not originally a thing of itself, but is only the absence of knowledge, and though man may be kept ignorant, he cannot be made ignorant. The mind, in discovering truth, acts in the same manner as it acts through the eye in discovering objects. When once any object has been seen, it is impossible to put the mind back to the same condition it was in before it saw it. Those who talk of a counter-revolution in France show how little they understand of man. There does not exist in the compass of language an arrangement of words to express so much as the means of effecting a counter-revolution. The means must be an obliteration of knowledge, and it has never yet been discovered how to make man unknow his knowledge or unthink his thoughts. Mr. Burke is laboring in vain to stop the progress of knowledge, and it comes with the worst grace from him, as there is a certain transaction known in the city which renders him suspected of being a pensioner in a fictitious name. This may account for some strange doctrine he has advanced in his book, which, though he points it at the Revolution Society, is effectually directed against the whole nation. Quote, the King of England, says he, holds his crown, for it does not belong to the nation, according to Mr. Burke, in contempt of the choice of the Revolution Society, who have not a single vote for a king among them, either individually or collectively, and His Majesty's heirs, each in their time and order, will come to the crown with the same contempt of their choice, with which His Majesty has succeeded to that which he now wears." Unquote. As to who is king in England, or elsewhere, or whether there is any king at all, or whether the people choose a Cherokee chief or a Hessian hussar for a king, it is not a matter that I trouble myself about. Be that to themselves. But with respect to the doctrine, so far as it relates to the rights of men and nations, it is as abominable as anything ever uttered in the most enslaved country under heaven. Whether it sounds worse to my ear by not being accustomed to hear such despotism than what it does to another person, I am not so well a judge of. But of its abominable principle I am at no loss to judge." It is not the Revolution Society that Mr. Burke means. It is the nation, as well in its original as in its representative character, and he is taking care to make himself understood by saying that they have not a vote, either collectively or individually. The Revolution Society is composed of citizens of all denominations and of members of both the Houses of Parliament, and consequently, if there is not a right to vote in any of the characters, there can be no right to any either in the nation or in its parliament. This ought to be a caution to every country how to import foreign families to be kings. It is somewhat curious to observe that although the people of England had been in the habit of talking about kings, it is always a foreign house of kings, hating foreigners yet governed by them. It is now the House of Brunswick, one of the petty tribes of Germany. It has hitherto been the practice of the English parliaments to regulate what was called the succession, taking it for granted that the nation then continued to accord to the form of annexing a monarchical branch of its government, 
for without this the parliament could not have had authority to have sent either to holland or to hanover or to impose a king upon the nation against its will and this must be the utmost limit to which parliament can go upon this case but the right of the nation goes to the whole case because it has the right of changing its whole form of government the right of a parliament is only a right in trust a right by delegation and that but from a very small part of the nation and one of its houses has not even this but the right of the nation is an original right as universal as taxation the nation is the paymaster of everything and everything must conform to its general will i remember taking notice of a speech in what is called the english house of peers by the then earl of shelburne and i think it was at the time he was minister which is applicable to this case i do not directly charge my memory with every particular but the words and the purport as nearly as i remember were these quote, that the form of a government was a matter wholly at the will of the nation at all times that if it chose a monarchical form it had a right to have it so and if it afterwards chose to be a republic it had a right to be a republic and to say to a king we have no longer any occasion for you unquote. when mr burke says that quote, his majesty's heirs and successors each in their time and order will come to the crown with the same content of their choice with which his majesty had succeeded to that he wears unquote. it is saying too much even to the humblest individual in the country part of whose daily labor goes towards making up the million sterling a year which the country gives to the person it styles a king government with insolence is despotism but when contempt is added it becomes worse and to pay for contempt is the excess of slavery this species of government comes from germany and reminds me of what one of the brunswick soldiers told me who was taken prisoner by the americans in the late war quote, ah said he america is a fine free country it is worth the people's fighting for i know the difference by knowing my own in my country if the prince says eat straw we eat straw unquote. God help that country, thought I, be it England or elsewhere, whose liberties are to be protected by German principles of government and princes of Brunswick. As Mr. Burke sometimes speaks of England, sometimes of France, and sometimes of the world, and of government in general, it is difficult to answer his book without apparently meeting him on the same ground. Although principles of government are general subjects, it is next to impossible in many cases to separate them from the idea of place and circumstance, and the more so when circumstances are put for arguments, which is frequently the case with Mr. Burke. In the former part of his book, addressing himself to the people of France, he says, quote, No experience has taught us, meaning the English, that in any other course or method than that of a hereditary crown can our liberties be regularly perpetuated and preserved sacred as our hereditary right, unquote. I ask Mr. Burke, who is to take them away? Monsieur de Lafayette, in speaking to France, says, quote, For a nation to be free, it is sufficient that she wills it. Unquote. But Mr. Burke represents England as one incapacity to take care of itself, and that its liberties must be taken care of by a king holding it in contempt. If England is sunk to this, it is preparing itself to eat straw, as in Hanover or in Brunswick. But besides the folly of the declaration, it happens that the facts are all against Mr. Burke. It was by the government being hereditary that the liberties of the people were endangered. Charles I and James II are instances of this truth, yet neither of them went so far as to hold the nation in contempt. As it is sometimes of advantage to the people of one country to hear what those of other countries have to say respecting it, it is possible that the people of France may learn something from Mr. Burke's book, and that the people of England may also learn something from the answers it will occasion. When nations fall out about freedom, a wide field of debate is open. The argument commences with the rights of war, without its evils, and as knowledge is the object contended for, the party that sustains the defeat obtains the prize. Mr. Burke talks about what he calls a hereditary crown, as if it were some production of nature, or as if, like time, it had a power to operate, not only independently, but in spite of man, or as if it were a thing or a subject universally consented to. Alas, it has none of those properties, but is the reverse of them all. It is a thing in imagination, the propriety of which is more than doubted, and the legality of which in a few years will be denied. 
but to arrange this matter in a clearer view than what general expression can heads under which what is called a hereditary crown or more properly speaking a hereditary succession to the government of a nation can be considered which are first the right of a particular family to establish itself secondly the right of a nation to establish a particular family with respect to the first of these heads that of a family establishing itself with hereditary powers on its own authority and independent of the consent of a nation all men will concur in calling it despotism and it would be trespassing on their understanding to attempt to prove it but the second head that of a nation establishing a particular family with hereditary powers does not present itself as despotism on the first reflection but if men will permit it a second reflection to take place and carry that reflection forward but one remove out of their own persons to that of their offspring they will then see that hereditary succession becomes in its consequences the same despotism to others which they reprobated for themselves it operates to preclude the consent of the succeeding generations and the preclusion of consent is despotism when the person who at any time shall be in possession of a government or those who stand in succession to him shall say to a nation i hold this power in contempt of you it signifies not on what authority he pretends to say it it is no relief but an aggravation to a person in slavery to reflect that he was sold by his parent and as that which heightens the criminality of an act cannot be produced to prove the legality of it hereditary succession cannot be established as a legal thing in order to arrive at a more perfect decision on this head it will be proper to consider the generation which undertakes to establish a family with hereditary powers apart and separate from the generations which are to follow and also to consider the character in which the first generation acts with respect to succeeding generations the generation which first selects a person and puts him at the head of its government either with the title of king or any other distinction acts on its own choice be it wise or foolish as a free agent for itself the person so set up is not hereditary but selected and appointed and the generation who sets him up does not live under a hereditary government but under a government of its own choice and establishment were the generation who sets him up and the person so set up to live forever it never could become hereditary succession and of consequence hereditary succession can only follow on the death of the first parties as therefore hereditary succession is out of the question with respect to the first generation we have now to consider the character in which that generation acts with respect to the commencing generation and to all succeeding ones it assumes a character to which it has neither right nor title it changes itself from a legislator to a testator and affects to make its will which is to have operation after the demise of the makers to bequeath the government and it not only attempts to bequeath but to establish on the succeeding generation a new and different form of government under which itself lived itself as already observed lived not under a hereditary government but under a government of its own choice and establishment and it now attempts by virtue of a will and testament and which it has not authority to make to take from the commencing generation and all future ones the rights and free agency by which itself acted but exclusive of the right which any generation has to act collectively as a testator the objects to which it applies itself in this case are not within the compass of any law or of any will or testament the rights of men in society are neither divisible nor transferable nor annihilable but are descendable only and it is not in the power of any generation to intercept finally and cut off the descent if the present generation or any other are disposed to be slaves it does not lessen the right of the succeeding generation to be free wrongs cannot have a legal descent when mr burke attempts to maintain that the english nation did at the revolution of sixteen eighty eight most solemnly renounce and abdicate their rights for themselves and for all their posterity forever he speaks a language that merits not reply and which can only excite contempt for his prostitute principles or pity for his ignorance in whatever light hereditary succession as growing out of the will and testament of some former generation presents itself it is an absurdity a cannot make a will to take from b the property of b and give it to c yet this is the manner in which what is called hereditary succession by law operates a certain former generation made a will to take away the rights of the commencing generation and all future ones 
and convey those rights to a third person who afterwards comes forward and tells them in mr burke's language that they have no rights that their rights are already bequeathed to him and that he will govern in contempt of them from such principles and such ignorance good lord deliver the world but after all what is this metaphor called a crown or rather what is monarchy is it a thing or is it a name or is it a fraud is it a contrivance of human wisdom or of human craft to obtain money from a nation under specious pretenses is it a thing necessary to a nation if it is in what does that necessity consist what service does it perform what is its business and what are its merits does the virtue consist in the metaphor or in the man doth the goldsmith that makes the crown make the virtue also doth it operate like fortunatus's wishing cap or harlequin's wooden sword doth it make a man a conjurer in fine what is it it appeared to be something going much out of fashion falling into ridicule and rejected in some countries both as unnecessary and expensive in america it is considered as an absurdity and in france it is so far declined that the goodness of the man and the respect for his personal character are the only things that preserve the appearance of its existence if government be what mr burke describes it a contrivance of human wisdom i might ask him if wisdom was at such a low ebb in england that it was become necessary to import it from holland and from hanover but i will do the country the justice to say that was not the case and even if it was it mistook the cargo the wisdom of every country when properly exerted is sufficient for all its purposes and there could exist no more real occasion in england to have sent for a dutch stadtholder or a german elector than there was in america to have done a similar thing if a country does not understand its own affairs how is a foreigner to understand them who knows neither its laws its manners nor its language if there existed a man so transcendently wise above all others that his wisdom was necessary to instruct a nation some reason might be offered for monarchy but when we cast our eyes about a country and observe how every part understands its own affairs and when we look around the world and see that of all men in it the race of kings are the most insignificant in capacity our reason cannot fail to ask us what are those men kept for if there is anything in monarchy which we people of america do not understand i wish mr burke would be so kind as to inform us i see in america a government extending over a country ten times as large as england and conducted with regularity for a fortieth part of the expense which government costs in england if i ask a man in america if he wants a king he retorts and asks me if i take him for an idiot how is it that this difference happens are we more or less wise than others i see in america the generality of people living in a style of plenty unknown in monarchical countries and i see that the principle of its government which is that of the equal rights of man is making a rapid progress in the world if monarchy is a useless thing why is it kept up anywhere and if a necessary thing how can it be dispensed with that civil government is necessary all civilized nations will agree but civil government is republican government all that part of the government of england which begins with the office of constable and proceeds through the department of magistrate quarter sessions and general assize including trial by jury is republican government nothing of monarchy appears in any part of it except in the name which william the conqueror imposed upon the english that of obliging them to call him their sovereign lord the king it is easy to conceive that a band of interested men such as placemen pensioners lords of the bedchamber lords of the kitchen lords of the necessary house and the lord knows what besides can find as many reasons for monarchy as their salaries paid at the expense of the country amount to but if i ask the farmer the manufacturer the merchant the tradesman and down through all the occupations of life to the common laborer what service is monarchy to him he can give me no answer if i ask him what monarchy is he believes it is something like a sinecure notwithstanding the taxes of england amount to almost seventeen millions a year said to be for the expenses of government it is still evident that the sense of the nation is left to govern itself and does govern itself by magistrates and juries almost at its own charge on republican principles exclusive of the expense of taxes the salaries of the judges are almost the only charge that is paid out of the revenue considering that all the internal government is executed by the people the taxes of england ought to be the lightest of any nation in europe instead of which they are the contrary 
as this cannot be accounted for on the score of civil government the subject necessarily extends itself to the monarchical part when the people of england sent for george the first and it would puzzle a wiser man than mr burke to discover for what he could be wanted or what service he could render they ought at least to have conditioned for the abandonment of hanover besides the endless german intrigues that must follow from a german elector being king of england there is a natural impossibility of uniting in the same person the principles of freedom and the principles of despotism or as it is usually called in england arbitrary power a german elector is in his electorate a despot how then could it be expected that he should be attached to principles of liberty in one country while his interest in another was to be supported by despotism the union cannot exist and it might easily have been foreseen that german electors would make german kings or in mr burke's words would assume government with contempt the english have been in the habit of considering a king of england only in the character in which he appears to them whereas the same person while the connection lasts has a home seat in another country the interest of which is different to their own and the principles of the governments in opposition to each other to such a person england will appear as a town residence and the electorate as the estate the english may wish as i believe they do success to the principles of liberty in france or in germany but a german elector trembles for the fate of despotism in his electorate and the duchy of mecklenburg where the present queen's family governs is under the same wretched state of arbitrary power and the people in slavish vassalage there never was a time when it became the english to watch continental intrigues more circumspectly than at the present moment and to distinguish the politics of the electorate from the politics of the nation the revolution of france has entirely changed the ground with respect to england and france as nations but the german despots with prussia at their head are combining against liberty and the fondness of mr pitt for office and the interest which all his family connections have obtained do not give sufficient security against this intrigue as everything which passes in the world becomes matter for history i will now quit this subject and take a concise review of the state of parties and politics in england as mr burke has done in france whether the present reign commenced with contempt i leave to mr burke certain however it is that it had strongly that appearance the animosity of the english nation it is very well remembered ran high and had the true principles of liberty been as well understood then as they now promised to be it is probable the nation would not have patiently submitted to so much george the first and second were sensible of a rival in the remains of the stuarts and as they could not but consider themselves as standing on their good behavior they had prudence to keep their german principles of government to themselves but as the stuart family wore away the prudence became less necessary the contests between rights and what were called prerogatives continued to heat the nation till some time after the conclusion of the american war when all at once it fell a calm execration exchanged itself for applause and court popularity sprung up like a mushroom in a night to account for the sudden transition it is proper to observe that there are two distinct species of popularity the one excited by merit and the other by resentment as the nation had formed itself into two parties and each was extolling the merits of its parliamentary champions for and against prerogative nothing could operate to give a more general shock than an immediate coalition of the champions themselves the partisans of each being thus suddenly left in the lurch and mutually heated with disgust at the measure felt no other relief than uniting in a common execration against both a higher stimulus or resentment being thus excited than what the contest on prerogatives occasioned the nation quitted all former objects of rights and wrongs and sought only that of gratification the indignation at the coalition so effectually superseded the indignation against the court as to extinguish it and without any change of principles on the part of the court the same people who had reprobated its despotism united with it to revenge themselves on the coalition parliament the case was not which they liked best but which they hated most and the least hated passed for love the dissolution of the coalition parliament as it afforded the means of gratifying the resentment of the nation could not fail to be popular and from hence arose the popularity of the court transitions of this kind exhibit a nation under the government of temper instead of a fixed and steady principle and having once committed itself however rashly it feels itself urged along to justify by continuance its first proceeding 
measures which at other times it would censure it now approves, and acts persuasion upon itself to suffocate its judgment. On the return of a new parliament, the new minister, Mr. Pitt, found himself in a secure majority, and the nation gave him credit, not out of regard to himself, but because it had resolved to do it out of resentment to another. He introduced himself to public notice by a proposed reform of Parliament, which in its operation would have amounted to a public justification of corruption. The nation was to be at the expense of buying up the rotten barrows, whereas it ought to punish the persons who deal in the traffic. Passing over the two bubbles of the Dutch business and the million a year to sink the national debt, the matter which most presents itself is the affair of the Regency. Never in the course of my observation was delusion more successfully acted, nor a nation more completely deceived. But to make this appear, it will be necessary to go over the circumstances. Mr. Fox had stated in the House of Commons that the Prince of Wales, as heir in succession, had a right in himself to assume the government. This was opposed by Mr. Pitt, and so far as the opposition was confined to the doctrine, it was just but the principles which Mr. Pitt maintained on the contrary side were as bad or worse in their extent than those of Mr. Fox, because they went to establish an aristocracy over the nation, and over the small representation it has in the House of Commons. Whether the English form of government be good or bad is not in this case the question, but taking it as it stands without regard to its merits or demerits, Mr. Pitt was farther from the point than Mr. Fox. It is supposed to consist of three parts. While therefore the nation is disposed to continue this form, the parts have a national standing, independent of each other, and are not the creatures of each other. Had Mr. Fox passed through Parliament and said that the person alluded to claimed on the grounds of the nation, Mr. Pitt must then have contended what he called the right of the Parliament against the right of the nation. By the appearance which the contest made, Mr. Fox took the hereditary ground, and Mr. Pitt the parliamentary ground, but the fact is, they both took hereditary ground, and Mr. Pitt took the worst of the two. What is called the Parliament is made up of two houses, one of which is more hereditary and more beyond the control of the nation than what the crown, as it is called, is supposed to be. It is a hereditary aristocracy, assuming and asserting indefeasible, irrevocable rights and authority, wholly independent of the nation. Where, then, was the merited popularity of exalting this hereditary power over another hereditary power, less independent of the nation, than what itself assumed to be, and of absorbing the rights of the nation into a house over which it has neither election nor control? The general impulse of the nation was right, but it acted without reflection. It approved the opposition made to the right set up by Mr. Fox, without perceiving that Mr. Pitt was supporting another indefeasible right more remote from the nation, in opposition to it. With respect to the House of Commons, it is elected but by a small part of the nation. But were the election as universal as taxation, which it ought to be, it would still be only the organ of the nation, and cannot possess inherent rights. When the National Assembly of France resolves a matter, the resolve is made in right of the nation, but Mr. Pitt, on all national questions, so far as they refer to the House of Commons, absorbs the rights of the nation into the organ, and makes the organ into a nation, and the nation itself into a cipher. In a few words, the question on the Regency was a question of a million a year, which is appropriated to the executive department, and Mr. Pitt could not possess himself of any management of this sum without setting up the supremacy of Parliament. And when this was accomplished, it was indifferent who should be regent, as he must be regent at his own cost. Among the curiosities which this contentious debate afforded was that of making the great seal into a king, the affixing of which to an act was to be royal authority. If, therefore, royal authority is a great seal, it consequently is in itself nothing, and a good constitution would be of infinitely more value to the nation than what the three nominal powers as they now stand are worth. The continual use of the word constitution in the English Parliament shows there is none, and that the whole is merely a form of government without a constitution, and constituting itself with what powers it pleases. If there were a constitution, it certainly could be referred to, and the debate on any constitutional point would terminate by producing the constitution. One member says, this is the constitution, and another says, that is the constitution. Today it is one thing, and tomorrow something else while the maintaining of the debate proves there is none. 
Constitution is now the cant word of Parliament, tuning itself to the ear of the nation. Formerly it was the universal supremacy of Parliament, the omnipotence of Parliament. But since the progress of liberty in France, those phrases have a despotic harshness in their note, and the English Parliament have catched the fashion from the National Assembly, but without the substance, of speaking of Constitution. As the present generation of the people in England did not make the government, they are not accountable for any of its defects, but that sooner or later it must come into their hands to undergo a constitutional reformation, is as certain as that the same thing has happened in France. If France, with a revenue of nearly 24 million sterling, with an extent of rich and fertile country above four times larger than England, with a population of 24 millions of inhabitants to support taxation, with upwards of 90 million sterling of gold and silver circulating in the nation, and with a debt less than the present debt of England, still found it necessary from whatever cause to come to a settlement of its affairs, it solves the problem of funding for both countries. It is out of the question to say how long what is called the English Constitution has lasted, and to argue from thence how long it is to last. The question is, how long can the funding system last? It is a thing but of modern invention, and is not yet continued beyond the life of a man. Yet in that short space it is so far accumulated that, together with the current expenses, it requires an amount of taxes at least equal to the whole landed rental of the nation, in acres, to defray the annual expenditure. That a government could not have always gone on by the same system which has been followed for the last seventy years must be evident to every man, and for the same reason it cannot always go on. The funding system is not money, neither is it, properly speaking, credit. It, in effect, creates upon paper the sum which it appears to borrow, and lays on a tax to keep the imaginary capital alive by the payment of interest, and sends the annuity to market to be sold for paper already in circulation. If any credit is given, it is to the disposition of the people to pay the tax, and not to the government, which lays it on. When this disposition expires, what is supposed to be the credit of the government expires with it. The instance of France under the former government shows that it is impossible to compel the payment of taxes by force when a whole nation is determined to take its stand upon that ground. Mr. Burke, in his review of the finances of France, states the quantity of gold and silver in France at about 88 million sterling. In doing this, he has, I presume, divided by the difference of exchange instead of the standard of 24 livres to a pound sterling. For Monsieur Necker's statement, from which Mr. Burks is taken, is 2,200 millions of livres, which is upwards of 91 millions and a half sterling. Monsieur Necker in France and Mr. George Chalmers at the Office of Trade and Plantation in England, of which Lord Hawkesbury is president, published nearly about the same time, 1786, an account of the quantity of money in each nation, from the returns of the mint of each nation. Mr. Chalmers, from the returns of the English mint at the Tower of London, states the quantity of money in England, including Scotland and Ireland, to be 20 million sterling. Footnote. See Estimate of the Comparative Strength of Great Britain by G. Chalmers. End of footnote. Monsieur Necker says that the amount of money in France, recoined from the old coin which was called in, was 2,500 millions of livres, upward of 104 million sterling, and after deducting for waste, and what may be in the West Indies or other possible circumstances, states the circulation quantity at home to be 91 millions and a half sterling. Footnote. See Administration of the Finances of France, Volume 3, by Monsieur Necker. End of footnote. But, taking it as Mr. Burke has put it, it is 68 millions more than the national quantity in England. That the quantity of money in France cannot be under this sum may at once be seen from the state of the French revenue, without referring to the records of the French mint for proofs. The revenue of France, prior to the Revolution, was nearly 24 million sterling, and as paper had then no existence in France, the whole revenue was collected upon gold and silver, and it would have been impossible to have collected such a quantity of revenue upon a less national quantity than M. Necker has stated. Before the establishment of paper in England, the revenue was about a fourth part of the national amount of gold and silver, as may be known by referring to the revenue prior to King William, and the quantity of money stated to be in the nation at that time, which was nearly as much as it is now. 
it can be of no real service to a nation to impose upon itself or to permit itself to be imposed upon but the prejudices of some and the imposition of others have always represented france as a nation possessing but little money whereas the quantity is not only more than four times what the quantity is in england but is considerably greater on a proportion of numbers to account for this deficiency on the part of england some reference should be had to the english system of funding it operates to multiply paper and to substitute it in the room of money in various shapes and the more paper is multiplied the more opportunities are offered to export the specie and it admits of a possibility by extending it to small notes of increasing paper till there is no money left i know this is not a pleasant subject to english readers but the matters i am going to mention are so important in themselves as to require the attention of men interested in money transactions of a public nature there is a circumstance stated by monsieur necker in his treatise on the administration of the finances which has never been attended to in england but which forms the only basis whereon to estimate the quantity of money gold and silver which ought to be in every nation in europe to preserve a relative proportion with other nations lisbon and cadiz are the two ports into which money gold and silver from south america are imported and which afterwards divide and spread themselves over europe by means of commerce and increase the quantity of money in all parts of europe if therefore the amount of the annual importation into europe can be known and the relative proportion of the foreign commerce of the several nations by which it can be distributed can be ascertained they give a rule sufficiently true to ascertain the quantity of money which ought to be found in any nation at any given time m necker shows from the registers of lisbon and cadiz that the importation of gold and silver into europe is five million sterling annually he has not taken it on a single year but on an average of fifteen succeeding years from seventeen sixty three to seventeen seventy seven both inclusive in which time the amount was one thousand eight hundred million leave which is seventy five million sterling footnote administration of the finances of france volume three end of footnote from the commencement of the hanover succession in seventeen fourteen to the time mr chalmers published is seventy two years and the quantity imported into europe in that time would be three hundred and sixty million sterling if the foreign commerce of great britain be stated at a sixth part of what the whole foreign commerce of europe amounts to which is probably an inferior estimation to what the gentlemen of the exchange would allow the proportion which britain should draw by commerce of this sum to keep herself on a proportion with the rest of europe would also be a sixth part which is sixty million sterling and if the same allowance for waste and accident be made for england which m necker makes for france the quantity remaining after these deductions would be fifty two million and this sum ought to have been in the nation at the time mr chalmers published in addition to the sum which was in the nation at the commencement of the hanover succession and to have made in the whole at least sixty six million sterling instead of which there were but twenty million which is forty six million below its proportionate quantity as the quantity of gold and silver imported into lisbon and cadiz is more exactly ascertained than that of any commodity imported into england and as the quantity of money coined at the tower of london is still more positively known the leading facts do not admit of controversy either therefore the commerce of england is unproductive of profit or the gold and silver which it brings in leak continually away by unseen means at the average rate of about three-quarters of a million a year which in the course of seventy-two years accounts for the deficiency and its absence is supplied by paper footnote whether the english commerce does not bring in money or whether the government sends it out after it is brought in is a matter which the parties concerned can best explain but that the deficiency exists is not in the power of either to disprove while dr price mr eden now auckland mr chalmers and others were debating whether the quantity of money in england was greater or less than at the revolution the circumstance was not adverted to that since the revolution there could not have been less than four hundred millions sterling imported into europe and therefore the quantity in england ought to at least have been four times greater than it was at the revolution to be on a proportion with europe what england is now doing by paper is what she would have been able to do by solid money if gold and silver had come into the nation in the proportion it ought 
or had not been sent out, and she is endeavouring to restore by paper the balance she has lost by money. It is certain that the gold and silver which arrive annually in the register ships to Spain and Portugal do not remain in those countries. Taking the value half in gold and half in silver, it is about 400 tons annually, and from the number of ships and galloons employed by the trade of bringing those metals from South America to Portugal and Spain, the quantity sufficiently proves itself without referring to the registers. In the situation England now is, it is impossible she can increase in money. High taxes not only lessen the property of the individuals, but they lessen also the money capital of the nation by inducing smuggling, which can only be carried on by gold and silver. By the politics which the British government have carried on with the inland powers of Germany and the continent, it is made an enemy of all the maritime powers, and is therefore obliged to keep up a large navy. But though the navy is built in England, the naval stores must be purchased from abroad, and that from countries where the greatest part must be paid for in gold and silver. Some fallacious rumors have been set afloat in England to induce a belief in money, and among others that of the French refugees bringing large quantities. The idea is ridiculous. The general part of the money in France is silver, and it would take upwards of twenty of the largest broad-wheel wagons with ten horses each to remove one million sterling of silver. Is it then to be supposed that a few people fleeing on horseback or in post-chases, in a secret manner, and having the French custom house to pass and the sea to cross, could bring even a sufficiency for their own expenses? When millions of money are spoken of, it should be recollected, that such sums can only accumulate in a country by slow degrees and a long procession of time. The most frugal system that England could now adopt would not recover in a century the balance she has lost in money since the commencement of the Hanover succession. She is seventy millions behind France, and she must be in some considerable proportion behind every country in Europe, because the returns of the English mint do not show an increase of money while the registers of Lisbon and Cadiz show an European increase of between three and four hundred millions sterling. End of footnote. The revolution of France is attended with many novel circumstances, not only in the political sphere, but in the circle of money transactions. Among others, it shows that a government may be in a state of insolvency and a nation rich. So far as the fact is confined to the late government of France, it was insolvent, because the nation would no longer support its extravagance, and therefore it could no longer support itself. But with respect to the nation, all the means existed. A government may be said to be insolvent every time it applies to the nation to discharge its arrears. The insolvency of the late government of France and the present of England differed in no other respect than as the dispositions of the people differ. The people of France refused their aid to the old government, and the people of England submit to taxation without inquiry. What is called the crown in England has been insolvent several times, the last of which, publicly known, was in May 1777, when it applied to the nation to discharge upwards of £600,000 in private debts which otherwise it could not pay. It was the error of Mr. Pitt, Mr. Burke, and all those who were unacquainted with the affairs of France to confound the French nation with the French government. The French nation, in effect, endeavored to render the late government insolvent for the purpose of taking government into its own hands, and it reserved its means for the support of the new government. In a country of such vast extent and population as France, the natural means cannot be wanting, and the political means appear the instant the nation is disposed to permit them. When Mr. Burke, in a speech last winter in the British Parliament, cast his eyes over the map of Europe and saw a chasm that once was France, he talked like a dreamer of dreams. The same natural France existed as before, and all the natural means existed with it. The only chasm was that the extinction of despotism had left, and which was to be filled up with the Constitution more formidable in resources than the power which had expired. Although the French nation rendered the late government insolvent, it did not permit the insolvency to act toward the creditors, and the creditors, considering the nation as the real paymaster, and the government only as the agent, rested themselves on the nation in preference to the government. This appears greatly to disturb Mr. Burke, as the precedent is fatal to the policy by which governments have supposed themselves secure. They have contracted debts with a view of attaching what is called the moneyed interest of a nation to their support. 
but the example in france shows that the permanent security of the creditor is in the nation and not in the government and that in all possible revolutions that may happen in governments the means are always with the nation and the nation always in existence mr burke argues that the creditors ought to have abided the fate of the government which they trusted but the national assembly considered them as the creditors of the nation and not of the government of the master and not of the steward notwithstanding the late government could not discharge the current expenses the present government has paid off a great part of the capital this has been accomplished by two means the one by lessening the expenses of government and the other by the sale of the monastic and ecclesiastical landed estates the devotees and penitent debauchees extortioners and misers of former days to ensure themselves a better world than that they were about to leave had bequeathed immense property in trust to the priesthood for pious uses and the priesthood kept it for themselves the national assembly has ordered it to be sold for the good of the whole nation and the priesthood to be decently provided for in consequence of the revolution the annual interest of the debt of france will be reduced at least six millions sterling by paying off upwards of one hundred million of the capital which with lessening the former expenses of government at least three millions will place france in a situation worthy the imitation of europe upon a whole review of the subject how vast is the contrast while mr burke has been talking of a general bankruptcy in france the national assembly has been paying off the capital of its debt and while taxes have increased near a million a year in england they have lowered several millions a year in france not a word has either mr burke or mr pitt said about the french affairs or the state of the french finances in the present session of parliament the subject begins to be too well understood and imposition serves no longer there is a general enigma running through the whole of mr burke's book he writes in a rage against the national assembly but what is he enraged about if his assertions were as true as they are groundless and that france by her revolution had annihilated her power and become what he calls a chasm it might excite the grief of a frenchman considering himself as a national man and provoke his rage against the national assembly but why should it excite the rage of mr burke alas it is not the nation of france that mr burke means but the court and every court in europe dreading the same fate is in mourning he writes neither in the character of a frenchman nor an englishman but in the fawning character of that creature known in all countries and a friend to none a courtier whether it be the court of versailles or the court of st james or carlton house or the court in expectation signifies not for the caterpillar principle of all courts and courtiers are alike they form a common policy throughout europe detached and separate from the interest of nations and while they appear to quarrel they agree to plunder nothing can be more terrible to a court or courtier than the revolution of france that which is a blessing to nations is bitterness to them and as their existence depends on the duplicity of a country they tremble at the approach of principles and dread the precedent that threatens their overthrow conclusion reason and ignorance the opposites of each other influence the great bulk of mankind if either of these can be rendered sufficiently extensive in a country the machinery of government goes easily on reason obeys itself and ignorance submits to whatever is dictated to it the two modes of the government which prevail in the world are first government by election and representation secondly government by hereditary succession the former is generally known by the name of republic the latter by that of monarchy and aristocracy those two distinct and opposite forms erect themselves on the two distinct and opposite bases of reason and ignorance as the exercise of government requires talents and abilities and as talents and abilities cannot have hereditary descent it is evident that hereditary succession requires a belief from man to which his reason cannot subscribe and which can only be established upon his ignorance and the more ignorant any country is the better it is fitted for this species of government on the contrary government in a well-constituted republic requires no belief from man beyond what his reason can give he sees the rationale of the whole system its origin and its operation and as it is best supported when best understood the human faculties act with boldness and acquire under this form of government a gigantic manliness as therefore each of those forms acts on a different base the one moving freely by the aid of reason the other by ignorance 
we have next to consider what it is that gives motion to that species of government which is called mixed government or as it is sometimes ludicrously styled a government of this that and to other the moving power in this species of government is of necessity corruption however imperfect election and representation may be in mixed governments they still give exercise to a greater portion of reason than is convenient to the hereditary part and therefore it becomes necessary to buy the reason up a mixed government is an imperfect everything cementing and soldering the discordant parts together by corruption to act as a whole mr burke appears highly disgusted that france since she had resolved on a revolution did not adopt what he calls a british constitution and the regretful manner in which he expresses himself on this occasion implies a suspicion that the british constitution needs something to keep its defects in countenance in mixed governments there is no responsibility the parts cover each other till responsibility is lost and the corruption which moves the machine contrives at the same time its own escape when it is laid down as a maxim that a king can do no wrong it places him in a state of similar security with that of idiots and persons insane and responsibility is out of the question with respect to himself it then descends upon the minister who shelters himself under a majority in parliament which by places pensions and corruption he can always command and that majority justifies itself by the same authority with which it protects the minister in this rotatory motion responsibility is thrown off from the parts and from the whole when there is a part in a government which can do no wrong it implies that it does nothing and is only the machine of another power by whose advice and direction it acts what is supposed to be the king in the mixed governments is the cabinet and as the cabinet is always a part of the parliament and the members justifying in one character what they advise and act in another a mixed government becomes a continual enigma entailing upon a country by the quantity of corruption necessary to solder the parts the expense of supporting all the forms of government at once and finally resolving itself into a government by committee in which the advisers the actors the approvers the justifiers the persons responsible and the persons not responsible are the same persons by this pantomimical contrivance and change of scene and character the parts help each other out in matters which neither of them singly would assume to act when money is to be obtained the mass of variety apparently dissolves and a profusion of parliamentary praises passes between the parts each admires with astonishment the wisdom the liberality the disinterestedness of the other and all of them breathe a pitying sigh at the burdens of the nation but in a well-constituted republic nothing of this soldering praising and pitying can take place the representation being equal throughout the country and complete in itself however it may be arranged into legislative and executive they have all one and the same natural source the parts are not foreigners to each other like democracy aristocracy and monarchy as there are no discordant distinctions there is nothing to corrupt by compromise nor confound by contrivance public measures appeal of themselves to the understanding of the nation and resting on their own merits disown any flattering applications to vanity the continual whine of lamenting the burden of taxes however successfully it may be practiced in mixed governments is inconsistent with the sense and spirit of a republic if taxes are necessary they are of course advantageous but if they require an apology the apology itself implies an impeachment why then is man thus imposed upon or why does he impose upon himself when men are spoken of as kings and subjects or when government is mentioned under the distinct and combined heads of monarchy aristocracy and democracy what is it that reasoning man is to understand by the terms if there really existed in the world two or more distinct and separate elements of human power we should then see the several origins to which those terms would descriptively apply but as there is but one species of man there can be but one element of human power and that element is man himself monarchy aristocracy and democracy are but creatures of imagination and a thousand such may be contrived as well as three from the revolutions of america and france and the symptoms that have appeared in other countries it is evident that the opinion of the world is changing with respect to systems of government and that revolutions are not within the compass of political calculations the progress of time and circumstances which men assign to the accomplishment of great changes 
is too mechanical to measure the force of the mind and the rapidity of reflection by which revolutions are generated all the old governments have received a shock from those that already appear and which were once more improbable and are a greater subject of wonder than a general revolution in europe would be now when we survey the wretched condition of man under the monarchical and hereditary systems of government dragged from his home by one power or driven by another and impoverished by taxes more than by enemies it becomes evident that those systems are bad and that a general revolution in the principle and construction of governments is necessary what is government more than the management of the affairs of a nation it is not and from its nature cannot be the property of any particular man or family but of the whole community at whose expense it is supported and though by force and contrivance it has been usurped into an inheritance the usurpation cannot alter the right of things sovereignty as a matter of right appertains to the nation only and not to any individual and a nation has at all times an inherent indefeasible right to abolish any form of government it finds inconvenient and to establish such as accords with its interest disposition and happiness the romantic and barbarous distinction of men into kings and subjects though it may suit the condition of courtiers cannot that of citizens and is exploded by the principle upon which governments are now founded every citizen is a member of the sovereignty and as such can acknowledge no personal subjection and his obedience can be only to the laws when men think of what government is they must necessarily suppose it to possess a knowledge of all the objects and matters upon which its authority is to be exercised in this view of government the republican system as established by america and france operates to embrace the whole of a nation and the knowledge necessary to the interest of all the parts is to be found in the centre which the parts by representation form but the old governments are on a construction that excludes knowledge as well as happiness government by monks who knew nothing of the world beyond the walls of a convent is as consistent as government by kings what were formerly called revolutions were little more than a change of persons or an alteration of local circumstances they rose and fell like things of course and had nothing in their existence or their fate that could influence beyond the spot that produced them but what we now see in the world from the revolutions of america and france are a renovation of the natural order of things a system of principles as universal as truth and the existence of man and combining moral with political happiness and national prosperity Quote, one men are born and always continue free and equal in respect of their rights civil distinctions therefore can be founded only on public utility two the end of all political associations is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man and these rights are liberty property security and resistance of oppression three the nation is essentially the source of all sovereignty nor can any individual or any body of men be entitled to any authority which is not expressly derived from it unquote in these principles there is nothing to throw a nation into confusion by inflaming ambition they are calculated to call forth wisdom and abilities and to exercise them for the public good and not for the emolument or aggrandizement of particular descriptions of men or families monarchical sovereignty the enemy of mankind and the source of misery is abolished and the sovereignty itself is restored to its natural and original place the nation were this the case throughout europe the cause of wars would be taken away it is attributed to henry the fourth of france a man of enlarged and benevolent heart that he proposed about the year sixteen ten a plan for abolishing war in europe the plan consisted in constituting a european congress or as the french authors style it a pacific republic by appointing delegates from the several nations who were to act as a court of arbitration in any disputes that might arise between nation and nation had such a plan been adopted at the time it was proposed the taxes of england and france as two of the parties would have been at least ten millions sterling annually to each nation less than they were at the commencement of the french revolution to conceive a cause why such a plan has not been adopted and that instead of a congress for the purpose of preventing war it has been called only to terminate a war after a fruitless expense of several years it will be necessary to consider the interest of governments as a distinct interest to that of nations 
whatever is the cause of taxes to a nation becomes also the means of revenue to government every war terminates with an addition of taxes and consequently with an addition of revenue and in any event of war in the manner they are now commenced and concluded the power and interest of governments are increased war therefore from its productiveness as it easily furnishes the pretense of necessity for taxes and appointments to places and offices, becomes a principal part of the system of old governments. And to establish any mode to abolish war, however advantageous it might be to nations, would be to take from such government the most lucrative of its branches. The frivolous matters upon which war is made show the disposition and avidity of governments to uphold the system of war and betray the motives upon which they act. Why are not republics plunged into war, but because the nature of their government does not admit of an interest distinct from that of the nation? Even Holland, though an ill-constructed republic, and with a commerce extending over the world, existed nearly a century without war, and the instant the form of government was changed in France, the republican principles of peace and domestic prosperity and economy arose with the new government, and the same consequences would follow the cause in other nations." As war is the system of government on the old construction, the animosity which nations reciprocally entertain is nothing more than what the policy of their governments excites to keep up the spirit of the system. Each government accuses the other of perfidy, intrigue, and ambition as a means of heating the imagination of their respective nations and incensing them to hostilities. Man is not the enemy of man, but through the medium of a false system of government, Instead, therefore, of exclaiming against the ambition of kings, the exclamation should be directed against the principle of such governments, and instead of seeking to reform the individual, the wisdom of a nation should apply itself to reform the system. Whether the forms and maxims of governments which are still in practice were adapted to the condition of the world at the period they were established is not in this case the question. The older they are, the less correspondence can they have with the present state of things. Time and change of circumstances and opinions have the same progressive effect in rendering modes of government obsolete as they have upon customs and manners. Agriculture, commerce, manufactures, and the tranquil arts, by which the prosperity of nations is best promoted, require a different system of government and a different species of knowledge to direct its operations than what might have been required in the former condition of the world. As it is not difficult to perceive from the enlightened state of mankind that hereditary governments are verging to their decline, and that revolutions on the broad basis of national sovereignty and government by representation are making their way in Europe, it would be an act of wisdom to anticipate their approach, and produce revolutions by reason and accommodation, rather than commit them to the issue of convulsions. From what we now see, nothing of reform in the political world ought to be held improbable. It is an age of revolutions, in which everything may be looked for. The intrigue of courts, by which the system of war is kept up, may provoke a confederation of nations to abolish it, and a European Congress to patronize the progress of free government, and promote the civilization of nations with each other, is an event nearer in probability than once were the revolutions and alliance of France and America. End of section 32. Recording by Colleen McMahon. End of Why Do We Need a Public Library by Various.